All right, and we're live. Cool. So let's give everyone a, a moment to join here. For those that made it in right at the start, uh, we are monitoring chats. So if you want to say hello, tell us where you're watching from, something interesting about you, uh, we do have a live feed of the comments. Yeah, it's always interesting to see, um, especially these days with the meetups being so virtual, it's the Northern Virginia meetup, but of course, I'm sure we have attendees from wherever. Yeah, it's definitely fun to, to see where everybody's from. Yeah, I'll tell you, in Northern Virginia, though, it's been a windy day. I actually ended up losing power earlier, and I thought, oh, no, it's because it's always very stable here. And then, uh, and then I thought, of course, the one day that we have to broadcast is going to be the day that it's out for hours. But yeah, it was 30 minutes, and then it was back on. Yeah. Well, at least you were on the West Coast a couple days ago. I heard they got hit with a parade of storms. Yeah, I saw um, something on the news called an atmospheric river, which I don't fully know what that means, but it sounded bad, and it made me grateful to live on the East Coast. <laughs> and we're getting a lot of interesting weather terms lately, huh? Yeah, there was a bomb. It's this was the headline, right? It was a bomb cyclone and an atmospheric river. And again, I don't, I'm not a meteorologist, but that sounded like <laughs> someplace that I was glad that I wasn't. It sounds like a rough time. Yeah. So for those that have joined, we're just giving a minute or two just to let everybody kind of get in so that everyone starts off at the same time so uh if you just jumped in you know say hello on chat we are watching it if you want to tell us where you're from where you're watching it from right now be uh interesting to see i currently am in austin and i will say it got we got a little cold spell here and it's been really hot the past couple days so winter has not yet made it to us uh, it's starting to cool down here um yeah, it's starting to cool down here. I was thinking I'm going to have to probably take my sweaters to uh, get dry cleaned here before too long because I think the uh, <laughs> shorts and polo shirt weather is coming to a close. We got some people from Connecticut, Florida, North Carolina, Texas. Cool. That's great. All right. Well, looks like we, uh, we've got a few people already joined in, so we could probably go ahead and get started uh, with our meetup here. So welcome everybody to the Future of Data Meetup Northern Virginia. Uh, my name is Nicholas Pelez. I'm going to be your host tonight. Uh, a little bit about me. I actually came up uh, from the aerospace uh, world. I did a lot of jet engine trending analytics development, basically had a lot of um, real world experience, we'll say, with, with fleets of military jet engines. I took that experience, came over to my current role uh, as a technical marketing at Cloudera, and it's really, it's been a fun adventure. Uh, tonight, we're gonna have a really cool presentation uh, by my colleague, Michael Ridley. We're gonna show you guys uh, a really interesting example of how you use distributed computing with Apache Spark to process a pretty large set of DICOM images. We're gonna be live streaming on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on YouTube, we will be uh, monitoring questions, so you know, please feel free to interact in the chat. We will be doing Q&A sessions as well. Uh, part of that, everybody that does participate in the chat will be entered into a drawing, so ask early and ask often. We're going to have two winners. Uh, the prize packages are pictured there. Uh, honestly, there's some, there's some pretty sweet stuff, so I highly recommend some interaction in the comments. We love getting questions. It makes the whole experience more fun. Uh, there's going to be a random drawing at the end of the presentation. So please stay to the end because you do have to be present to win those awesome prizes. So um, again, just a quick introduction of myself. I'm going to be your host for the night. Um, I'll be peeking in and out, right? But the real uh, star of the show is going to be Michael Ridley. So I'll let him uh, give himself a, a quick intro. Well, thanks so much, Nick. Um, and, you know, I, speaking of monitoring the chat, I was noticing just to close the uh, the loop on the uh, prior conversation uh, from before, Brian is letting us know that a bomb cyclone is a collision between two major weather systems, usually a front and an extra tropical cyclone. So, you know, you come for the spark and you learn about weather. Um, so thank you, Brian, for sharing that with me. Now I've, I've learned something new today. Hopefully, hopefully everybody here will learn. So yeah, my name is Michael Ridley and I've, uh, been with Cloudera for, uh, ever, uh, no, I don't know for gosh, I don't know, nine, nine years, eight, I don't know, a long time. 
Uh, I've worked in our consulting organization, and then for the last couple of years, I've been in our technical marketing organization. And uh, tonight's presentation is going to be on processing DICOM images. I will caveat, Nick, that I am not a oncologist or a radiologist or an MRI specialist. Um, so Nick is going to be taking all of those questions. Um, however, uh, I have worked, um, I do have some background in, in health tech. Uh, I worked years ago on a medical record system for the Department of Defense. Uh, and then uh, more recently at Cloudera, I've worked with a number of our uh, health and life sciences customers uh, doing things like processing chart notes and, and that sort of thing. So uh, we have an interesting presentation, I hope. Uh, it's topical and timely, and, and uh, I think a good example of, of how you can leverage Spark, whether on Cloudera or not, uh, to, to do some distributed uh, processing of some medical imaging. Awesome, Paul. Well, I'm sure everyone's excited to see it, so let's uh, take it away. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So, well, here, so here's my, my slide. If you forgot where you were, this is the future of data, Northern Virginia meetup. And tonight we're going to be talking about processing DICOM medical images with Apache Spark. I should have said Apache Spark there in the, uh, in the subtitle to honor their trademark, but it is an Apache software foundation project. Uh, so what are we talking about? Well, um, this meetup and this topic is inspired by a, uh, Kaggle competition and, uh, the competition that we chose, which it did just end. So if you were excited to enter it, unfortunately that one has closed, but I'm sure there'll be other opportunities uh, in the future to, to do more. Uh, but this one in particular is on uh, brain tumors. And so uh, the competition is sponsored by the Radiological Society in association with the Medical Image Computing and Computer Assisted Intervention Society. And what they were doing is they're looking at uh, MRI studies of glioblastoma patients. And so glioblastoma, and again, I'm not an oncologist at all or, or medical doctor of any kind, but uh, it is a, the most common form of brain cancer and also the most, um, the one with the worst prognosis, right? The, the most bad outcomes. Uh, and it, if it rings a bell, uh, again, it is the most common, um, but probably most recently that I can think of in the headlines, uh, it is the cancer that, that killed former U.S. Senator John McCain. But and many others as well. So it's a common brain cancer and uh, it doesn't have a good prognosis, but <clears throat> it turns out that there is a genetic sequence, which is MGMT protomer methyl methylation, um, which the presence of this genetic sequence has been shown to um, increase the um, favorability of the prognosis of the outcome. And it has also been shown to uh, that when you have the presence of this sequence, intervention with chemotherapy can be uh, effective. And uh, I guess if, if you don't have that, then, then chemotherapy is maybe not as, as effective. So the current practice is to biopsy the tumor and run a study in a lab uh, to look for the presence of this genetic sequence. The, problem with that is that it, uh, first of all, it requires a biopsy. So you have to cut into someone's head to take a tissue sample. And then um, it requires a couple weeks of lab processing to determine. And in something like a fast moving brain cancer, you don't want to have um, you know, any additional delays before you have uh, intervention. And so the question is whether you can leverage medical imaging to detect the presence of this genomic sequence. And um, spoiler alert, first of all, tonight's meetup, we're going to talk about step one, which is sort of the getting the data ready to train a, a model. Um, and then um, we're hoping down the road to, to show the training of that model and then, and then model serving. But tonight's focus is really just on taking the DICOM images and turning them into PNGs. The other thing is, uh, so if you're if you're wondering that the result or the outcome of whether you can do it, uh, I don't know yet, right? Um, I don't know, and we didn't actually enter the competition, uh, but we'll see. Um, so the theory, I, 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 my understanding is that radiologists, I guess, looking at the scans can't, you know, just look at it and know. But there's a question about maybe you could train a machine learning model and it might find something in the imaging that wouldn't be um, wouldn't be obvious to a uh, to a human practitioner. So. 
Uh, here is my super complicated diagram of how this is going to work. Uh, we have taken the data set from the uh, competition and uploaded it into Amazon S3. And the files are in DICOM format, more on that in a moment. And we are leveraging the Apache Spark framework to basically take these DICOM files and output PNG images that are scaled down to 150 by 150 and in grayscale. And then the, th the thinking is that you could then take that data set and potentially train a neural network. So that may be a future uh, opportunity for us to, to, to sort of go further with this. So um, I don't know how familiar, I know we have people in the audience probably that are Spark experts and, and maybe some people that are not as familiar with Apache Spark. The benefit to using a parallel processing framework like Apache Spark is exactly that, that it's parallel processing. So this is a fairly large data set size. I think, I think the total data set is like 130, 150 gigabytes. And then the training set, of course, is, is probably half that, but still it's tens of gigabytes, right? So it's a reasonable size data set. And so certainly that's not so big that you couldn't process it on a single computer, but it, it certainly benefits from uh, parallelization. And so you'll see here, I took these out of uh, one of the job runs that we did. The, the DAG or the directed acyclic graph is pretty simple, right? It's really just um, reading the file, doing a map, and then, and then that's pretty much it. But the reason that I included the slide is you can see here, these are all the executors that it spins up. And so you can sort of, the cool thing about doing it in the cloud, because this is all done in, in CDP public cloud, um, the benefit of that is that you can have as much parallelization as you want to pay for, right? You can have as many executors as you want, I guess, up till one per file, right? Which would be uh, a lot. <clears throat> and so we did this work in Python and you could certainly do it. And we also did, well, two things. We did it in Python using PySpark and we also did it on Amazon. You could absolutely do this in another programming framework like Scala or Java, uh, leveraging the Spark uh, distributed computing framework, and you could do it on another cloud provider like Microsoft. Um, you could read, you could do all of this reading out of ADLS instead of S3, or you could certainly run an on-premises reading and writing from HDFS or or whatever. Um, the the reason that I picked Python is just because I find it easier to do rapid ETL development um, using PySpark and Python because, well, for one thing, the Python language has less overhead. Uh, in my opinion, at least, and then some of the other alternatives. And then there's really good library support out there. So we were able to leverage, of course, the PySpark library, and then Pillow, which is a fork of the Pill Python image library uh, for doing some of the, the image manipulation. There's a super handy PyDICOM library that uh, uh, parses and processes DICOM files. And then we used uh, NumPy uh, to do some of the image manipulation as well uh, on working with the arrays. A couple comments before we get into the demo. So we're coming up to the demo here shortly, but um, a couple things. Um, initially, we were looking at OpenCV instead of Pill, uh, but for whatever reason, and I don't know, you know, folks in the chat maybe want to chime in with ideas. I'd be interested to learn. But for whatever reason, um, I was getting uh, like JVM crashes when I was calling the OpenCV libraries from the executors. And so given just deadlines and timelines and the fact that I didn't actually need to do anything with OpenCV that I couldn't do with a different library, we switched. But I know a lot of times you see these demos using OpenCV. And so there's just commentary. We, we know that it exists, but for whatever reason, it just wasn't playing nice with Spark, uh, uh, when, at least the way I was doing it. Um, the other thing is you'll see in the code, uh, we're reading the DICOM images using the binary file Spark input format but we're writing it out using the AWS uh, SDK. The reason for that is because with um, Spark SQL, you can read in a recursive directory or, well, a directory, but in this case, it's not really a directory. It's like a key space in, in S3, uh, but you can read in recursively files into a uh, uh, data frame, uh, or in our case, we're transforming it into an RDD. But when you write things out, Spark is sort of architected to write out aggregates. So it's good if you want to write out a parquet file. It's good if you want to write out a um, sequence file or, or whatever. But what we actually wanted were individual objects in S3 for each PNG file. And 
the only way that I could think to do that would be to um, uh, to create a custom output format in Spark. And it was less work to just leverage the S3 API from within a map function. And the other thing too that I'll comment on as I sort of caveated, I am certainly not a DICOM medical image expert. So the processing that we're doing, I think is fairly minimal and it's probably a fairly naive approach. Uh, there is this article that I found that I thought was excellent uh, from Franklin Heng at UCSF, um, or he was at UCSF. I, I, did a, I don't know him. I did a little research. It looks like he's moved on to a startup now. But in any event, um, we'll make the slides available. And there is a good article that he wrote that seems fairly comprehensive on how to uh, work with DICOM files in, um, in Spark. So, uh, and, uh, you know, again, this is not a cloud era advertisement, but, uh, but we are leveraging the cloud era platform and, uh, in particular, we're using the, the cloud era data engineering service. So without further ado, let's, uh, get onto the demo. So there's a couple things that I wanted to kind of point out, and I think the way we'll do it is let's do this. Let me. Let me kick, let me get this example going because it'll take a little bit and then I can show you a couple of other things. So this is my Cloudera data engineering cluster. And so what we need to do first is we have, well, let me do this. Let me show you the code real quick. So we have the code here and this is all available on the public GitHub. Um, there's a tutorial. So you can go to the cloudera.com slash users page and get all this information. But Here's the code. And so the, the real point here is that we have a minimal, but we have a requirements.txt. So these are the libraries. And this shouldn't be a shock because I just showed you a slide that had these libraries on them. Um, so what we need to do, uh, I'm being told that the font is hard to read and I don't know if I can increase it. So, but luckily, luckily we're not gonna really be looking at this too much. So just take my word for it that there's a requirements.txt. Because we have that, here, I can do it this way. Because we have that, um, what we need to do in Clutter Data Engineering is we need to create a resource that will uh, effectively kind of build the, the Python virtual environment for that. So let me go ahead and create that resource. Um, so I just pasted that, but you can see I really am typing. It's really live. Um, I just pasted it from another window. Uh, OK, so I have to type in my password. That's fine. Okay, so what we do is we create a, so I have, okay, so this is the one that I just made and it's pending build. And then this is my backup one because it is a live demo. So just in case something crashes or it doesn't build, I have one that's already built, but hopefully we won't have to use it. Hopefully we will um, use the one that we're building now. So we've created this thing called a Python virtual environment or Python ENV. And then what we need to do is actually upload that requirements.txt. So, um, so what this is going to do now is this is uploading the local requirements.txt into this um, virtual environment that we're creating. And then that's going to install all of the prerequisites. So um, now if we go back to our resource list, what we will see is that now we are in status building. And so this will take a few moments. Um, one thing we can do is we can, and this is using, by the way, the uh, Cloudera Data Engineering CLI. So this is just the CVE CLI. And so, oh, and uh, you know, what's even better is if we type the command correctly. So, um, uh, so what we can do to check on the status, because it says building, so we can run list events and this will show. And so it's, um, it's still going. Uh, this will take a few minutes, uh, but you can see now it's 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 pulled the uh, uh, requirements.txt and it's basically going through. And you can see here, right? It's installing all the things that it's installing, and so that'll take a few moments, uh, but not too long. And so let me go back over here. So this is our environment. So if we go here to the uh, virtual cluster that we have, and I go over here to resources, and let me see if I can make this even a little bit bigger. Okay, uh, so hopefully. Uh, yeah, let's make that a little bigger. Okay, so um, you can see this is my backup one that I've already made, but but this is the one that we just made, and you can see here, 548, it's really true. It's really today, it's really live. It's live or is it Memorex? It's live. Um, but you'll see there's nothing there. And the reason that there's nothing there is because it's still building. 
Uh, so let's go back over here and let's see if we are getting close to, if I type the right command, if we're getting close to, ah, so now it says ready. So it's right here, it says ready. So just like that, it is now ready. So if I refresh, let's see, let's test, live test. In theory, if I refresh this window, it should list all the things that it installed. Let's see. Oh, look at that. It worked. Amazing. So uh, this is all the stuff that was in the requirements.txt, as well as any like requirements that those had, right? So it'll, it'll figure out the dependency chain there. Great. So now we have this uh, environment. And I'll tell you, in terms of running Spark jobs, running Python jobs in Spark or Spark, PySpark jobs, I find this to be really nice because one of the challenges that you have with running um, Spark jobs in Python is making sure that you have the uh, uh, resources, ever, the libraries that you need everywhere. And so this, you know, CDE, of course, running on Kubernetes, um, it all just works. Now, I'm going to go ahead and do two quick things. The first thing that I'm going to, okay, so we have our setup ready to go here. Let me just check and see if I have commented out. Um, well, that's not going to work because they're both commented out. Check that. All right. Uh, you know what? Let's do this. I'm going to run just one patient. To start. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, all right. So this is my command line. Um, word of caution, and this is mentioned in the tutorial as well. The, the, as I mentioned, we're running the... Uh, the AWS SDK, or we're leveraging the AWS SDK to write the output files back out to um, S3. And so that requires the Amazon uh, to authorize the Amazon API SDK. So the way we're doing that is not ideal, probably. It's fine for a demo, it's fine for the meetup, um, but this will expose in the job conf your uh, AWS access key and secret access key. So in real life, you that's fine if you're the only person that has access to the virtual cluster, but um, you probably want to work with your InfoSec team to to follow whatever best practices your company has around secrets management. Um, so again, this is like the demo version, but be aware that Cloudera is not recommending that you actually do this in production. So I don't want to, don't want to get any angry phone calls from InfoSec people later this week. This is the demo version. Uh, okay, so this is running and... Um, Let's see here, and you'll see. So this is just a single um, patient that I ran this on because I wanted to run it sort of quickly. And you'll see that it says that it succeeded. And let me, well, before I do anything else, let me um, let me do this. Let me uh, edit that file again. And now, um, probably was going a little bit fast, but um, what I'm doing here is I'm just changing the data. Uh, sorry, the yeah, the well the the path, right? I'm changing the path. So, so zero, 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 this is, and I'm going to show you while this is running, I'm going to show you the data, kind of the way the data is organized. Um, but the point is, this is a single patient, and then this is going to be all the patients. And I don't know if we're going to have time for that to actually run. Uh, it takes about 15 minutes, but that's okay. Um, so we're just going to kick it off anyway. And while that's running, let me show you a couple things. So this is the competition. This is the, uh, competition that we took the data from and this is the data set so it's 136 gigabytes and and as i said we've uploaded this to s3 uh but you could run it local i mean the nice thing about spark is you could run this locally on the data and work on your in fact that's what i did when i was developing the analytics and uh getting the code working and then and then you just run it in the cloud for a more distributed uh processing environment but this is the data uh structure. So you've got test data and train data, right? So the theory is that hopefully maybe in a future meetup, we can show how you would take the training data and build a model and then and then serve that model against the test data to, to validate whether or not uh, your, um, your model is, is working or not. So in the training data set, which is what we're focused on today, these are all just different patients here. And then um, and then it has different studies. And again, this is where I'm not an expert on MRIs. I I, re, I looked up what these things are and I understand them as well as the paragraph that I read about each of them. Uh, but for each one of the studies, for each one of the patients, then you have a series of images. And why is it a series of images? Because it's an MRI. Um, so I, uh, the DICOM file format is a common medical image 
file format and it includes metadata and some other stuff. So that's why we have to do this transformation in the first place. That's why we're converting from DICOM to, um, to PNG. The DICOM files themselves would not be suitable for feeding into a, a computer vision neural network. I downloaded this program called Slicer 3D, which is open source. Uh, I believe it's funded by NIH and it can read DICOM files. So I just loaded a couple of them in there and you'll see that these, this is sort of the metadata that you get from the DICOM. So this is all just baked into the DICOM file. So it has, um, you know, the series description and it has the count and the image sizes. And, and again, we're resizing. So we're going from 512, 512 to, uh, to 150. And then if I go over here to oh, there, if I go here and I go to volume rendering, <clears throat> you can see here is one of the studies and this is the 3D view. But the reason that there were so many files in that directory is because it, it has slices. So this is, this is panning through the, the study uh, in 3D because that's what an MRI is. So that's why there's so many different um, files in the directories. There's different slices. So this is a tool that is meant for processing DICOM data. Uh, so this is just kind of showing you the raw data that we're working with. Uh, but then what we need, and, and the whole point of the exercise is to translate this into um, PNG files that we can then uh, use for whatever purpose. So that is the data. That's what we're doing. If I go over back to the data engineering um, world here and I go to jobs, I'll show you a couple of things. So you'll see, here's the one that I'm just running now. Uh, it's obviously in progress. Here's the one that we just ran. And so if I click on <clears throat> the one that we just ran and uh, one of the things that people sometimes say is, well, how do I, how do I know that there's a benefit to, to running it in parallel or, or you know, how do I see the parallelization? And so, if I look at this one, actually, wait, is this the right stage? Make sure I'm getting the right stage. Otherwise, it will not be useful. Um, no, that was the right stage. So, uh, okay. So if I go to this stage here, you'll see that on the single patient, it's added a couple different executors. And you also saw that it ran pretty quickly in about a minute. So that is the amount of parallelization that it, that it could benefit from from one. But now, if we go over here, this one is running the whole data set. And so we'll see what happens because it's a live demo. But I would expect and I would hope that um, that for that stage, which so this is the same stage, uh, I'm hoping, ah, and good, well, we have many more executors. And this should look like the um, uh, screenshot that I took to, to put in the slide deck. And so as you can see, it, it ran a couple different executors to parallelize for the one patient, but there were only but so many files in there, only so many slices, because there's however many slices times however many studies, but it still ran in a minute. And then now, um, you know, it looks like we've got what, 30, 35, 36 executors running. Um, and so these are all happening in parallel. So these are different, uh, different execution units that are running the code. And so what code are we talking about? So I was going to show you in my fancy IDE, but um, the font on that is hard to see. So let me do something different. Let me adapt, improvise and overcome. So I have another window that I can bring over. <clears throat> and so if we take this and we do that and we do that, let's look at it in VI, uh, which is fine. It'll be like a real technology. Um, so we'll go through the code real quickly. Uh, again, this is very, um, we're not trying to win any awards here on uh, the most sophisticated DICOM processing ever. Uh, but I think that it's a useful framework that you hopefully could leverage to do whatever arbitrary processing you want to do. So, um, okay. So I'd like to, because I said that we were doing it at 150 by 150, but somehow this turned into 224 at some point. Um, so it's 224 by 224. That's what we're converting it into. And then this is just some S3 data you would, or some S3 paths, you would change this to whatever you're using. And then there's two functions, but let me kind of flip down to the end here. So basically what we're doing is we have, we're creating a um, uh, Spark SQL 
uh, session. And then we're using that, even though we're not actually using Spark SQL at all, the reason that we're using Spark SQL instead of just a standard Spark context is because Spark SQL is where you get this recursive file lookup from. So uh, I don't know, talk to the Spark overlords about that. That's how the API works. So we are recursively loading in all the files from the input path, which in this case is the S3 bucket. And then just to have it be a little interesting, we print out the image count. Uh, so that goes to standard out. And then the first thing we're doing is we are processing the images. And so by processing the images, what that really means is we are converting. So what this DICOM images RDD is going to have. Uh, so this one uh, here, okay, let me do that. Uh, so this one here, this DICOM images is an RDD of exactly that, of DICOM images. What we want is an RDD of PNGs, uh, and then we're going to write those somewhere. So the way that we do that <clears throat> is we have this process image map function. And so we're running this as a map. So basically what's happening is it's reading in all of these different keys from S3, or it could be files from HDFS or files from your local file system. But it's reading in all these different DICOMs, putting it into a, to a giant RDD, and then in parallel, and that's what those different executors were, it's, it's applying this function on each of those. And so, um, uh, you know, again, this is some pretty basic um, processing here, but but we're using the PyDICOM library to, to read it in, and then we're applying a LUT because uh, the way DICOMs work, you need to apply a LUT, and then we're normalizing it, and, uh, normalizing the data, and we're sort of getting it into this um, grayscale domain, and then <clears throat> and then we're doing a little bit of image, a uh, little bit of exception handling because there actually were a couple of files in here, I think that were, that were invalid. So we had to, uh, add some exception handling. And then, um, and then this is where we're using the Python image library. And so basically what we have is a NumPy array and we are turning it into a PNG. And then, um, and then, that is so we're ah, so we're, I was like, where is it saving? It's saving here into the PNG uh, image, uh, which is a byte array, I think. Or yeah, it's a, well, it's a byte IO. Uh, so this would be a file or a file like object. So we're sort of cheating or we're making a file like object in memory because we're not saving it yet. So we save that there, and then we're returning um, a, uh, a uh, uh, an associative array here that has some metadata, you don't necessarily need all this. This is sort of just uh, so that we have stuff to print out so that it's kind of interesting. But really, all that matters is where it says content PNG image. So that's the map function that takes the DICOM image and converts it to PNG. <clears throat> and then that's what we return is the image RDD element. And then if I go back down to the bottom, um, you'll see that the next thing we do is we do this uh, file names thing where we're just capturing the list of file names that we're outputting. But the purpose of that is to take this processed images, which again, that's the RDD of all of the PNG files. And we're applying a map function to that that writes them out to S3. So that's this function here. Um, and so again, it's the same idea. You have this big distributed data set of PNG files in memory. <clears throat> and you call this function that's basically going to write them out to S3 uh, objects. And so uh, that's exactly what we did. We take PNG image, which is this RDD image content. So that's exactly this, right? That's exactly this element here, which is the actual image. And then we do some munging around with the paths just to get the file names that we want to use. And we sort of create an output key. And then we just use the Boto3 SDK, which is, this is the Amazon AWS SDK. Again, you could do this um, with Azure. You could do it writing HDFS, you could do it, you know, a lot of different ways. And you would just need to change this little part here to write to wherever is appropriate for you. And then, um, and then we're just, uh, uh, basically, oh, one thing we do have to do is seek, I learned this the hard way. You have to seek back to the beginning because it's a file object. And so it has like an offset pointer, uh, into it. So you need to seek back after you write. Otherwise I was getting these crazy problems where I was getting CRC errors, where the amount that I was writing to S3 didn't match. And I was like, what is going on? And then I realized, oh, because I'm writing nothing because my file pointer is already at the end because I've already written the PNG. 
uh, to the end of it. So anyway, you have to seek to the beginning. And then we put it uh, in S3. So this is what actually uploads it. And then we just, again, we just return some, some kind of metadata just so we have something interesting to print out. And that's really all we're doing. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty simple. But the cool part, I think, is that you could take this code and let's say that you are working in the healthcare life sciences space and you have DICOM images, whether from an MRI or not, because my understanding is that DICOM is used for other types of medical imaging. Um, you know, you could do anything in this in this function here. So you could, for example, um, you know, I was showing in Slicer that it has, uh, here, let's go back to the DICOM images. Uh, you know, so it has this metadata and, and I think other things could have even more metadata, you know, study descriptions and, and other things. You could pull that out and create, you know, a Spark SQL um, uh, uh, data set and then persist that out to like a virtual data warehouse. I mean, there's a ton of things you could do in that process function. So we're converting to PNGs, but you could do whatever. Um, also, we're converting to grayscale PNGs, but I'm not sure that that's even the best idea. Okay, uh, so you could convert to color, you could do whatever. So there's the, the sky's the limit. Um, as you can see, our job is still running. This is the one that's running against everything. Um, I ran this yesterday to make sure that it worked, and it took 16 minutes. So um, I don't know how long this has been running for, but I would expect that it would take about 16 minutes. Let's see, 553. Okay, so it might have like five more minutes. So we can maybe come back and check on it, but I mean, it seems like it's working. Um, and then, oh, and then one thing that I did want to show as well is, um, so I pulled one of the uh, uh, processed images from, so let me, uh, let's make this go away. So that's not as hard to see, make this bigger. Um, so this is one of the processed PNG. So this is what we're getting as an output. So we're taking the, the MRI uh, DICOM files input, and we're just outputting a ton of these, like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these into S3 using that same folder structure where it's uh, patient slash study type and then slash slice. Uh, and then again, we can do further processing with that. Um, and so if we were gonna go down the path of working on the competition, the next step would be to take these images and train a, a, a neural network with them, but you could do whatever. So I think that is probably what I have for the demo for today. Um, so Nick, I will turn it back over to you. We can't hey. hear you, Nick, but you are a good looking man. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sorry, I had a, a little uh, internet glitch here, and I guess it changed my audio devices. So, uh, first of all, thank you for the awesome demo. Uh, and while you were doing it, we got a bunch of really good questions. So uh, let's let's go all the way from the top. Uh, we'll look at the first one from Andres. He says, did you have the DICOM images already in some cloud storage? No. So what I did was, so so the competition provides them as a handy uh, 130 gigabyte zip file. So that's easy to work with. And so I downloaded it and I uh, unzipped it and then I uploaded them to S3. And then another follow-up from Andres, he says, sometimes the challenge is getting the heavy DICOM medical images to cloud. So I was thinking of converting on-premise, then uploading the reduced PNG to the cloud to save space and transmission time. You know, it's so funny that you say that, Andres. I, are you a plant? Because what we were originally, so when I was originally talking to Nick about this idea, uh, because, you know, Cloudera, we're all about the hybrid cloud here. And so I was actually saying that, you know, the way to do this really to kind of show the benefit of our hybrid cloud platform is exactly that. It, again, it's like you could, it's what a softball, right? What a setup. Um, because exactly that, right? You might have on-prem, Medical images. These look. These are um, anonymized, de-identified public data sets, so that's fine. But in real life, you might have, um, you know, a study that has PHI uh, that you can't put in the cloud, or you don't want to put in the cloud. You have an infosec concern about that, and so you could absolutely, um, you know, do the processing on-prem, anonymize the output, and then upload the reduced to the cloud to do the model training. And that's a great example because. If you, what you want in the cloud is 
whatever it is that you're going to want to do the model training on. And then in the cloud, you can leverage special purpose uh, compute resources like um, uh, special purpose compute resources like GPUs. Um, and, and so you might not have that on-prem. So then you could do the model training on-prem. Then once you, or sorry, the model training in the cloud. And then once you have the model built, you could bring that back on-prem to do the model serving against PHI data, right? Because then you could take the scans out of the machine and and hit them against that model to, to, to do your diagnostics. So and, absolutely. And I'll just add a little to that also. It kind of depends on what resources you have where. And that's kind of the beauty of writing everything in Spark. So like if we happen to have a bare metal, you know, or a, a server sitting under our desk that had, a you know, 64 cores and a bunch of, a bunch of RAM, we would have been way better off running it locally. I personally don't have any, a machine anywhere near that powerful. But since we also have the cloud ability to like leverage those resources, right? We can spool up almost an arbitrary large set of resources on the cloud to do it, right? So it just kind of gives us the flexibility to either run it there, on premises, wherever it kind of makes the most sense. So that was a fantastic yeah. question. Thank you. Uh, so the next one, uh, that's more of a comment saying OpenCV works for me locally on AMD Radeon hardware. Yeah, and it's more portable than CUDA. Well, I, I will note, um, we actually have within Cloud Air, we have some runtimes that are already set up with the CUDA drivers pre-installed. Uh, I, I will agree with you that a lot of times CUDA uh, and just getting all the right libraries to interact, play happy with each other is a little bit of a pain. But we have set up runtimes that actually already have everything set up and ready to go. So that saves you a ton of hassle if you end up going that route. Yeah, for sure. You know, and just one other comment on that. Um, in this case, it was easy to swap out the pillow library because we weren't really doing anything heavy duty with OpenCV that, I mean, I suppose converting an image to PNG would benefit from some GPU acceleration, but um, you know, it works fine on a CPU, right? So, so for this particular use case, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't super important that we that we use OpenCV. Got it. So the next question: uh, How many images are processed per second? So uh, just doing some some quick math. Uh, if you said the last run took about sixteen minutes, there are a little over four hundred thousand images. Uh, that comes out to about four hundred and seventeen images per second. But again, I think. And correct me if I'm wrong here, Michael, but that scales based yeah. on how many resources we happen to have thrown at it. No, that's 100% right. So so you saw that it was scaling up to about 35 executors. We could have increased that. And so that's the nice thing about the cloud. And, and it's interesting, you know, people talk about performance in the cloud. Oh, who's got the faster cloud? Well, really in the cloud, it's about price performance um, because your performance can be whatever you want it to be, right? If you want to throw a thousand servers at that, you could have more performance, um, but maybe a bigger bill. Fair. And that kind of is, you know, cost benefit, right? Do you need mm -hmm. more resources or can do you, do you want to save a little bit of money and kind of? Yeah, well, and then, you know, because I know we're going to get a comment about it, right? So in theory, if everything was 100% linear and there was no overhead of any kind, then it should be six one half dozen the other, right? Because either you have more, uh, less resources running for longer or more resources running for for shorter and you know it sh it should it should even out but in real life of course you don't get perfect linear scalability and you do have overheads so um but at least you have more proverbial knobs to turn right oh for sure yeah, yeah. again you know how many images per second do you want to process uh i mean how many do you need to right and then you just scale your cluster for that and then you figure out if that's um you know if the economic if that's economically viable for you to do Makes sense. Next question, where can I get this source code? I'll keep your eyes peeled. We have a resources slide that comes up, but I will give you the short answer is if you go to cloudera.com backslash users, you can find uh, all of the demos that we've ever done. And this will be uh, the most recent one. Yes, it's a forward slash though. It is a forward slash. Good correction. <laughs> uh, could one convert to a voxel representation and vectorize that? Um, that one's a little bit beyond my uh, ability to answer, to be completely honest with you. Yeah, I'm thinking <laughs> about it. Uh, can we convert it? I mean, pr probably, but we didn't. So, what, I mean, what you're saying makes sense, but we didn't do that. So, I don't want to say definitively yes or no, uh, because we, I, we didn't go down that route. Um, it, it seems like you could, but. 
I guess what I would add to that is that it kind of depends on what you're looking at for your outcome. So in our case, right, our idea was to train a TensorFlow model uh, with these images, right? So for that, it made the most sense to have our data in the form of a, you know, one one fifty by one fifty pixel, yep. just grayscale image. Uh, so, if you had a reason to use vectors instead of images, or if for some reason your whatever you're doing down the line with it, as far as training goes, prefers to use vectorized data, then I'm yeah, for sure. That. I mean, it is for sure true that you could take. Um, so I right. I mean, the part that the part that gives me pause is can you convert it to a voxelized representation? Because I just I mean, it seems like you could, but I haven't done that. What I could say for sure is that you could leverage, again, if you could get like OpenCV working, like like apparently one of our viewers was able to, um, you could certainly pull out feature vectors, right? So you, you could pull out features. Instead, like, instead of converting to a PNG, you could take the image in a NumPy array and you could pull out features, create feature vectors, do dimensionality reduction, 100%, you could do all that. So uh, next question is, is it true above about what George said, OpenCV has no hard dependency on CUDA? It would be nice not yeah, to true. be locked into one GPU chipset. Mm, I mean, I don't think you need a GPU at all to use OpenCV. All I don't right. think. I, I mean, I, 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 go, I, I, maybe, maybe, uh, I mean, maybe that's something we should we should take a note and look into, but I don't think, I mean... I don't think that we do. I don't think it does either, but uh, I'm not going to answer that too confidently. So we'll we'll get yeah. back to you on that one. Just looking real quick at their <laughs> website. <laughs> Sorry, I'll take the next question while you look that up. Uh -huh. uh, does Cloudera Data Science Workbench come as a demo sandbox in a browser, like Databricks, for example? Cloudera so Data Science Workbench is available as part of the Cloudera Data Platform. So what you can do is you can do a... Um, uh, we have a, what do they call them? Test drive, uh, a test drive of CDP public cloud, which would give you access to Cloudera machine learning. Um, and then you could go from the test drive into a trial. So that is something you can sign up for on our website. And we got a, a comment here from Brian Butler, just backing you up saying OpenCV does not require a GPU. He does it a lot on a 12 core Mac Pro. Yeah, that's what, okay. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, I, th awesome. I mean, it's, I'm sure it benefits from it, but yeah, it's the, the benefit of OpenCV is that it, it, from my perspective at least, is that it, it packages up a lot of computer vision algorithms in a nice way with good implementations that probably do, well, not probably, they definitely do leverage GPUs if you have them, but if you don't, it'll just probably run slower, but be on the CPU. Shout out to Brian for also explaining to us what a bomb cyclone was at the beginning. I so, know. He knows Brian. data science. He knows <laughs> uh, computer vision. He knows. I mean, this guy is like, this, what does he not know? It's great. Uh, for so, a job, Brian, let us know. <laughs> Last question here. Which version of Spark? Ah, this is Spark 3.1, I believe. Um, actually, I can tell you. I mean, I don't need to. I don't need to believe. I can, <laughs> I can tell you exactly. Three point one point one, point, I believe. Okay, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say it. It, it tells me in uh, if I can find my browser, it tells me in Flutter Data Engineering what version it is. Uh, yeah, I'll double check. But yeah, all right. Three one well, one. that looks to be all the questions we've got. So uh, let's go take a look at some resources in case you want to learn more. Uh, the first link here is to a, a comprehensive guide uh, that goes a little bit deeper into visualizing and analyzing DICON images using Python. Uh, the second link here is to our users page that I referenced earlier. That's going to be where we have all bunch of tutorials, videos, and stuff all Cloudera and CDP related in case you are curious or you want to do it yourself or you want to just find the source code. Um, if you follow the tutorials, you will also find a link to our GitHub where we host all of the content, all of the assets, like all, all the code and stuff, so you can pull it and kind of see how we do everything. Uh, we also have a link to discover CDP, uh, in case you want to just go see what it's all about. We've only really barely touched the surface of what it can do, right? We're just kind of showed you a little window of it, but there's a ton of other things that the CDP is doing nowadays. And then the last link is for the future of data meetup for North Virginia, uh, in case you want to see more of you know, what you just saw today, we do meetups pretty often, you know, one or two a month at least. So we would uh, love for people to come. On that note, some participants may receive a survey. 
Uh, we really would love if you guys could take just a little bit of time to give us some feedback. Uh, we really want to know what you like, what you don't like. That way we can improve and that way we can actually show you stuff that you care about and we can spend more time focused on the stuff that you want to hear instead of... Yep. All right. So now time for the real exciting part, which everybody's been waiting for. And that is the raffle. So let's make sure that we're on here and we got all of the contestants Perfect. All right. So the first winner is. And I have to wait all the way to the end because tricks you sometimes. All right. Vishal Verma. Uh, one second here. So uh, before I go to the second one, uh, the winners, please email or contact information to social media at cladera.com. That's how you're going to get your prize. So that was prize package number one, and number two is going to go to the lucky Alex Dedov. I hope I pronounced those right. Uh, congratulations to the two raffle winners. Uh, thank you for asking questions and making it engaging. And honestly, thanks to everybody that asked questions and just put comments. It makes it a lot, a lot more fun to have some audience interaction. Uh, so... On behalf of the team, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out, helping make a great event this evening, especially for all of you that participated in the chat. Uh, definitely made it fun for us. So we look forward to seeing you all at the next future Data Meetup, and I hope you have a good rest of your evening.